I want one of my other glasses. Could you get my glasses out of the bathroom? I'll do it. Okay, we have no one waiting to get in. Okay, we will. Okay, I've turned on the recording here. Uh, some of you have asked about your research paper. And um, I would encourage you to go ahead and choose a text that you would like to write on. It can be Old Testament or it can be New Testament. If you write on, the, on an Old Testament text, you should use the uh, book by Stuart, Old Testament exegesis. And if you write on a New Testament text, you should use the book by fee, New Testament exegesis. And Stuart will give you 12 steps. Fee will give you 15 steps. So, but it depends on if you're going to write on the Old Testament or the New Testament. So I would like you for next time to choose a text to write on. Uh, normally, it would be like from eight to ten verses. And you will exegete that text, and you will go through the steps that Stuart and Fee, Stuart or Fee, uh, give you. And uh, you should be able to uh, do a good job on that. So, do you have questions? Uh, go I ahead and, um, and feel free to choose a text that you would like to write on. Uh, don't write on 1st or 2nd Corinthians because we're going to be dealing with those quite a bit in class. Uh, Rachel? And should we um, mail our topic or the text we have chosen to you first before going about it? Uh, that would be a good idea. Okay. And then I'll, <clears throat> I can give you feedback okay. and make, make suggestions if I think that... Uh, you know, it's too long or too short, or um, maybe you haven't uh, really chosen it, chosen where the thoughts end and begin, you know. So you, you don't want to be in the middle of a, a paragraph or a thought. You want to have a unit. And uh, if you follow the paragraphs in your Bibles, uh, those are pretty good guides, although some of the newer uh, translations have a lot of little paragraphs, so it, it's it's harder. Um, I have discovered that the old English translation, the ASV, American Standard Version, uh, tends to divide the paragraphs by by thoughts quite well. Uh, there may be one in the library. So you may want to consult that. Otherwise, I, you probably won't need to do that. You can just you can just judge. You know, is Paul starting a new uh, thought pattern here and ending it here, or you know, is this narrative in the Old Testament starting here and is there a logical uh, breaking off place here? Okay. Do you have any other? Uh, Questions? So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, do you need to have a foundation of Greek and Hebrew? No, you don't. Uh, okay. We are going to have a lesson on how to use the Greek tools if you don't know Greek, and how to use the Hebrew tools if you don't know Hebrew. And um, I, I'm really thinking about putting those off to the end uh, because we have so much. Uh, so much to cover and not a lot of time. But uh, what I've thought about doing is just giving you uh, some content, like in a Word document or a PDF, and you can, uh, can use that rather than, and, and you would get everything that we would do in the lecture. 
Okay. Thank you, sir. But yeah, you you do not need to use Greek and Hebrew. And if you don't have a knowledge of Greek and Hebrew, you can still do good exegesis. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. God, we are so thankful that we can see your hand at work in our lives, leading and guiding. Lord, every step that we've taken, Lord, you have been there. And even when we've tried to go our own way, you have been there with that still small voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. Lord, we wanna thank you for bringing each one of us to this place in our lives. Lord, I wanna thank you for bringing each of these to APTS. Uh, most of them physically, uh, some are in other places at this time, but you brought us all to APTS for this Zoom conference uh, to sharpen our tools as we prepare to go into the, uh, the harvest field. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to us at this time. Lord, purify our hearts. Help us to stay right with you, Lord. Oh God, we just pray that you would touch us with your purifying spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would direct our thoughts, that we would open our minds to, for what you have for us. Open our hearts to the fullness of your presence. We thank you that you are present in this Zoom session. We give you glory. We thank you and praise you for all that you've done for us. Be glorified in all that we say and do. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen. 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 And as we begin, I must begin with, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? When you, amen. Yeah, with your, your mood, you're muted and I can't hear you say amen, but uh, that's all right. I know that you're with me. Amen. 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 All right. Um, as you uh, go on to Moodle, in each section, you will see some um, some documents that are there. Uh, for example, in um, under introduction and course objectives. Uh, there is an article there by Carson, How to Interpret the Bible. Under History of Biblical Interpretation, there's one by Fee, Critique of Reader Response Criticism. Verkler and Ayayo, History of Biblical Interpretation. Packer, Hermeneutics and Biblical Authority. I, and, uh, and the other chapters have those as well. Uh, I would suggest that you read those because um, the textbooks that we're using, for example, Fee and Stewart, doesn't have a section on the history of uh, New Test or history of biblical interpretation. And so you're going to have the lecture, but this will give you some other input. And uh, the same with the other sections there. Um, those of you who, uh, well, you're, you've all been here every time. Is there anybody missing? I don't want to take the time to read all the names. So if you're not here, say I. Okay, well then that means we're all here, right? Okay, I think we are. Um, all right, let's get into the lesson for tonight. Uh, we were on versions, looking at different translations of the New Testament. And uh, oh, you know, I forgot to turn on um, the, um, the PowerPoints. So excuse me for just a moment. And I will bring up the PowerPoint here. We'll do a share screen. Oh, 
All right, and one more adjustment here. Okay. Uh, do you do you all see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Okay. Good. I need to turn the volume down on Vicky's computer. Okay. Uh, we have a chart here that shows uh, different English versions of the Bible. In the left column is revisions of the King James. You know, the King James is the, the granddaddy of them all. And there have been quite a few revisions of the King James. There we have the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, the New King James Version, the uh, New Revised Standard Version, the English Standard Version. All of these are revisions of the King James. Um, in the middle column, we have new versions, the Jerusalem Bible, the New English Bible, the New American Bible, the Living Bible, the Good News Translation, New International Version, New Century Version, God's Word, Contemporary English Version, The Message, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, and by the way, they've changed the name of that. They've taken Holman off. So it's the Christian Standard Bible. And I've been doing my devotional reading out of that for the last couple of years. And uh, I'm really quite impressed with it. I hadn't really heard much about it before. And then the uh, New English translation, uh, NET. Uh, and then in the right column, we have revisions of the new versions. So we have the New Jerusalem Bible, which is a revision of the Jerusalem Bible. However, I think it was yesterday, I came to find out that there is now a revised New Jerusalem Bible. So we would need a, another column on the right, revisions of revisions of new versions. <laughs> um, and then we have the Revised English Bible, which is a revision of the New English Bible the New Living Translation, which is a revision of the Living Bible. And the Living Bible is actually a paraphrase. The New Living Translation is a, a real translation. And it, uh, I think, is a quite good translation as well. And then uh, today's NIV, the TNIV, uh, which is no longer published. Now it is just the NIV but uh, it is in the, uh, uh, it's the 2011 version. And here is a family tree of translations, uh, sort of what we had there in that chart uh, that just sort of gives the, uh, the new versions that have come from the, the others. Uh, you'll see there are a lot coming from the King James on the left. Uh, the NIV has had some different uh, uh, revisions. And then the uh, Jerusalem Bible and the New English Bible have had one each. Let me say a few words about the New International Version. This is the most widely used English version in the world. Um, it's, original, it's an original translation. It's not a revision of another one. Uh, it's not a revision of the King James. It was done by evangelical scholars. It was first published in the 1970s. And I was pastoring at the time. And I asked my congregation what versions they used. On a Sunday night, I just said, how many of you are using the King James? Uh, a few people. How many of you are using the RSV, Revised Standard Version, which I was using? Nobody. How many are using this, that, the other, a few? How many of you are using the NIV? About 85% of the hands went up. And at that point, I didn't even have an NIV. So I, uh, 
I went out and bought one and have been using it ever since. It was revised in 1984 and then again in 2011. Now they all had the same name. So the only way that you can tell which version you have is to look at the back of the title page and look at the date. One of the differences between the 1984 and the 2011 uh, edition is that the 2011 is what we call gender neutral. That is, um, the 1984 version and versions before that uh, tended to be masculinized. Um, for example, the Greek word anthropos means uh, man, it means a human. It's, a, it's talking about a human being. And um, hold on just a second. I think we have somebody wanting to get in. Okay, maybe not. Okay, uh, the Greek word, uh, word anthropos uh, means man, um, but it doesn't mean masculine necessarily. It means person, it means human being. So if you translate it man, in today's world, people are gonna think male. Uh, for example, if I said, you know, I saw a man walking down the street in a dress. What are you going to think? Here is this guy wearing a dress because you automatically think male. You see a man, he's a male. Uh, it didn't used to be that way in English. And so to translate anthropos consistently as man, when it's really referring to people, uh, is a mistranslation. And if you look at the traditional translations, that's what they tend to do. So um, when it says that um, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, does that mean that God only wants men and not women to be saved? Well, of course not. God wants everybody to be saved. He wants people. And so the NIV 2011 translates it, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And there are other words like this. For example, the word um, adelphos, which means brother, can also mean sister. So there is a word adelphe, which means sister, but the word adelphos can refer to both uh, brothers and sisters. So if you look at the newer translations like the NIV 2011, when Paul uses the word uh, adelphos, they will translate it brothers and sisters. Uh, another issue is that in English, we only have uh, masculine or feminine pronouns that apply to people. We have like he or she. Now we also have it, but we don't wanna call a person an it. So um, if you're talking about just people, are you gonna say he? Well, that's generally been used. Some people say she once in a while, just to show that we're talking about people in general, or use he slash she, uh, which is really awkward. And uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2.11, it says, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him. That is 1984 version of NIV. 
the 2011 says, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? So you don't have man and you don't have him. Um, what they've done is they've taken him and they have made it plural, which can refer to both men and women. So uh, they use they instead of him, okay? So there's gonna be a mistranslation there somewhere. Uh, it's referring to everybody, so if you choose to, to use him, you're not including the women. But if you make it plural, Paul there used the singular. And so that is also a mistranslation. So you gotta choose which mistranslation you want. Uh, do you want it referring to only men or do you want it referring to um, uh, a plural instead of a singular? Um, the NIV opts to go with the plural rather than uh, making it refer to men. And I think that they've chosen uh, the better of the two choices there. Uh, do you have questions here? Comments before we go on? Yes, sir, I have a question. Yes, Rachel. Um, like um, I have uh, read uh, in some pamphlets that, you know, the NIV, some people consider that it's not really good because they say that some of the verses are missing. There are like... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there was a, a lady here in North Carolina, Assembly of God pastor's wife, who put that up on Facebook just recently. And it comes around every once in a while. I dealt with that question back in the 1970s when I was a youth pastor. And one of my youth came up and said, the new versions have taken away so many uh, verses that should, uh, should be there. Well, when this lady wrote that here a little while ago, I just went on her Facebook and I said, why do you think it is that almost all of the modern versions don't include those verses. Well, there's a very good reason for that is, uh, and for that, and it is that those verses were not there in the original text. Mm -hmm. um, so if you use the, the oldest and the best manuscripts, you're not gonna have those verses in there. That's why they don't appear in the modern versions. Uh, but people say, oh, the NIV is terrible. It's taken out all these verses. You know, people want to destroy God's word. Th that is simply ignorance. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, they, they need to study textual criticism. If you take New Testament introduction, you'll be introduced to that. Um, so it uh, it really disheartens me. Yes, go ahead. So, like, can we say that the older versions that people consider more authentic, like the uh, KJV and NASB, like the literal ones? So, can we say that they are not are they based on the oldest manuscripts? Exactly, they're not. Okay. Uh, the King James version. Uh, is based on what is called the Textus Receptus. Mm -hmm. It was a group of manuscripts that were assembled by a man by the name of Erasmus in the early 1500s. He's the one mm -hmm. who was the first to publish a Greek New Testament. It was based on, I think, 11 manuscripts, mm -hmm. uh, most of which were very late and uh, not the most accurate. Let me give you an example. When he published it, it did not contain that verse in 1 John 5, 7 that says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Well, uh, he was uh, attacked for that because people said, you've left out this verse on the Trinity, and it's an important verse. And it should be there. 
Well, none of his Greek manuscripts had that verse. And so he said, if you can show me a Greek manuscript that has that verse, I'll include it. And they came up with a Greek manuscript. Probably they made it themselves. Uh, but uh, that is how it got into the Textus Receptus. That is why it is in the King James Version. Uh, the, the oldest Greek manuscript that we have that has that verse is from over 600 uh, AD. And so um, the study of textual criticism is very important and to me it is very interesting. And uh, so hopefully you'll take New Testament introduction from me and uh, we'll go over that. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, uh, what I'd like to do is give you some examples of the, uh, the difference between the NIV 1984 and 2011. Because when I would teach exegesis courses, I would have to say several times, the NIV just didn't get it right here. And um, I think with every place that I said that, when the 2011 came out, they had did what I considered correcting it. Uh, for example, in the NIV 1984, 1 Corinthians 6, 13 to 14, uh, notice the quotation marks here. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. That's in quotes. And then it says, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, as I read that, uh, for many years, I thought, Paul cannot be saying this. Paul cannot be saying that God will destroy both the stomach and food. Um, look at chapter 15. And uh, when we come to the, the NIV 2011, it makes a lot more sense. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. That's the quotation. That is what the Corinthians were saying. Paul comes back then and says, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Hey, yes, that works. That fits. Um, it's a, uh, a correction uh, to the way the 1984 uh, rendered it. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 7, 1, now for the matters you wrote about, this is 1984 NIV, it is good for a man not to marry. Now, what does that sound like? It sounds like Paul is saying, uh, you wrote about this, and this is what I'm saying. It is good for a man not to marry at all, okay? But if you look at the NIV 2011, it says, now for the matters you wrote about, quotation mark, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, end quote. What he is doing is responding to what the Corinthians wrote him. They said it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. He says nothing here about being married. Look at the 1984 version. It is good for a man not to marry. The word there is not marry. It is to have a woman, and it means to have her sexually. That is what the Corinthians were saying. Paul rebuts that. He answers that and denies that in chapter 7, verses 1 to 7. Um, In 13.3, uh, uh, a difference here. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. In other words, if you give your body to be burned, but you don't have love, you're nothing, or you gain nothing. Um, in 13.3, uh, in the uh, 2011, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, 
but do not have love, I gain nothing. Which is it? Is it to give my body to the flames or to give my body that I may boast? In the Greek, there is only one little letter of difference between those verbs. And it's hard to tell which is the right one. And uh, in 84, they went for the flames. In 2011, it is that I may boast. In uh, 14.2 of 1 Corinthians, uh, this will give the, the uh, difference in the gender neutral. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. And then in 14.2, uh, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the spirit. And um, let me give one more example here. In First uh, Timothy, First uh, Timothy uh, chapter three, where Paul gives the requirements for overseers, he says in two thousand uh, in the 1984 version. Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable able to teach. Okay, the husband of one wife, he says there. In the 2011 version, it says now an overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. And I believe that that is the correct translation. And there are many reasons for that. One is that all the qualifications, except for able to teach, are character qualities. Uh, they do not have to do with the person's history. They are what kind of person this person is. And, uh, and we could go into the grammar as well, which we won't take the time to do now. But uh, those are some differences in the two versions of the NIV. Let's look at choosing a version of the Bible. Choose a version that uses the older and better manuscripts. That would be most of the modern versions. Choose a version that accurately translates the Greek text. Again, most of those will do a pretty good job. Uh, a paraphrase may go off some, you know, because they're trying to be creative and put it in a, a new light. Uh, but most of the modern translations do quite well. Choose a version that effectively communicates in today's language. And this is probably the thing that separates the two, um, or, or the, the many. Uh, does it communicate what God's word is saying? Does it communicate well so that people can understand it? And um, if you look at this, the, uh, the King James is probably not going to be the best because it uses later and more corrupt manuscripts. And the English has changed since 1611. It uses thee, thou, and ye, which we don't use anymore. Um, the difference between spirit and ghost. Uh, the word ghost today refers to like a, a, a spirit that is taking on a bodily form, you know, like in a haunted house. And, um, Spirit it fits much better. Some words mean the opposite of what they meant in 1611. Uh, the meat offering in the Old Testament is the only all vegetable offering in the law. So um, there are some good reasons for uh, not using the King James in today's world. Now, I know that many people love the King James. There are people who think that it's the only good version that there is. Um, well, you know, I would certainly disagree with that, I think, on good basis. Okay, questions or comments here? All right.
we will pause here. Um, we're going to give a quiz. It'll be on chapters five and six of Fee. And um, there we go. We've got it going. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, the, the general principles here are those that I believe are the things we have to pay close attention to. And since we're not using a, a standard hermeneutics textbook, you know, one of the big thick ones like uh, often you would get in the hermeneutics course, uh, these are the elements that I believe are necessary to interpret the Bible correctly. So these are general principles of hermeneutics. Uh, later on, we are going to look at how this applies to the various genres. For example, epistles, Old Testament narrative, gospels, parables, and that kind of thing. Um, we're also going to include some other hermeneutical issues here. Um, there are probably other important principles that we could have included, but these are the ones that I have chosen. All right. Let us go to the screen share. Uh, general principles of hermeneutics. Number one. Study the literary context. In 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, uh, 16 to 17, it says in the King James Version, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, I imagine if I asked all of you, what does this verse mean? That many of you would get it wrong. The reason for that is that we have no context here. Probably at least half of you would say, Paul is here saying that we that our bodies are the temples of God, so we need to take care of our bodies. So we shouldn't smoke, we shouldn't drink alcohol, you know, we should uh, avoid COVID, we should do all of these things. And that would be absolutely wrong. We need to look at the context. When I was a teenager, I would uh, read my Bible and I would make notes on uh, the different verses. And that is exactly what I wrote when I came across this verse, or these two verses. Um, that the, the, um, the lesson here is take care of your body because you are the temple of God. <clears throat> Look at the context. Uh, starting at 110 here in 1 Corinthians, Paul addresses the problem of division in the church. In 3.1, he compares the church to a field, and he compares the apostles to the workers in the field, and God is the landowner. Starting at 3.10, he changes the analogy and compares the church to a building with Paul being a wise architect, Jesus being the foundation, and the members of the church building on the foundation. How one builds on the foundation will be judged on the day of judgment. And then we have the two verses for our consideration here. Um, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that God's Spirit dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, God, 
uh, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Um, what is the temple here? Okay, what is the temple? In context, what is the temple? Okay, you are God's building. Jesus Christ is the foundation. I have built on it, Paul says, as a wise master builder. So let every person be careful how he builds on this building. And he says on the day of judgment, our works for how we built on this uh, foundation are going to be judged. What is the temple here? Who can tell me what is the temple? Just unmute yourself. Church of God. Church church of God. His body, body is church. The church? The church. Yeah. The church. It is the church. That's right, Peter. You, plural, are God's temple, singular. From the context, that is the only legitimate interpretation. Are our bodies temples of the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, they are. And Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But that is not at all what Paul is talking about here. Here the temple that he is talking about is the church. So if you destroy the church, you will be destroyed, Paul says. The context is crucial to the interpretation. The NIV makes it clearer here. It says, don't you know that you yourselves, plural, are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So the, the point here is that we need context. Uh, it's crucial that we look at verses in context. It is the cults that take verses out of context and build doctrines on them. So if you're looking at a verse, the context for that verse is gonna be the paragraph in which uh, it's situated. The context for the paragraph is gonna be the paragraphs before and after it. The context for those paragraphs is the chapter. The context for that chapter is the book, maybe even a section of the book, and then the book. So in this case, uh, we would look at the paragraphs before and after uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. We would look at all that Paul is saying in chapter three. Then we would look at all that Paul is saying in, uh, we could go with the, the first part of this book or the entire book. And then the, the next context is the section of the New Testament. Uh, Paul's epistles, all of the epistles. And then the next larger context is that of the New Testament. And then the next larger context is that of the whole Bible. The, the closer we are to our uh, passage here, the more important the context is. And then we move out and out and out and out. I cannot overstress too much the importance of context and interpretation. It is said that a text without a context is a pretext. You can make a text say anything you want if you take it out of context. Uh, for example, the Bible says, Judas went away and hanged himself. It also says, go and do likewise. And it says, 
what you are about to do, do quickly. So from scripture, you can tell people that they are to go out and quickly hang themselves. But that would be taking the verses out of context. We call that proof texting. Proof texting. You want to, you want to uh, establish a doctrine, you take a verse out of context and base your doctrine on that. That is proof texting. Uh, now, when I was a boy, it was very popular to have what we called promise boxes. Uh, the promise boxes are little boxes uh, about so big. Uh, they're normally made in the shape of a loaf of bread, usually made out of wood or out of plastic nowadays. And uh, there was a slot in it in which you could put cards. So in the morning, you would take out a, a uh, card with a verse on it. It had a Bible verse, and you would read that verse, and that was your verse for the day. So throughout the day, you would look at that verse, and uh, you would think about it, maybe memorize it. And of course, it's good to uh, look at Bible verses like that and, and learn them. But the problem with that method is that it takes it completely out of context. When you use the promise box method, you have no idea what went before or after. Do not use the promise box method. Um, it's, it, it's not a good thing to do. You know, sometimes people will open their Bibles and the first verse that their finger lands on, they will say, this is God's word for me today. Again, it's a problem of taking it out of context. Uh, some people have called this the Ouija board approach to scripture. Uh, I don't know if you know what a Ouija board is, but it's a, a kind of device that is supposed to tell you the truth. And some people say that they are you know, demon inspired, which maybe they are. Um, but I recently heard Charles Stanley on television say that this is what you ought to do. You ought to open your Bible and the first thing that you read, you should take as God's will for you. Um, for an example, Klein, Blomberg and Hubbard relate this experience. They say, one of us knew a young man who had to decide whether to enlist in the armed forces or go to college. Opening his Bible at random, he saw the passage in Ezekiel that speaks of people coming from Tarshish to Tyre in ships. Although this passage contains no command for anyone to go anywhere in a ship and has nothing to do with becoming part of the armed forces, this young man interpreted the text as a call to join the Navy. Chances are good that he deprived himself of a college education by making a decision he thought was God's will, but perhaps was not. More seriously though, he completely misunderstood what role the Bible should have in Christian decision-making process. Uh, when I was teaching at AGTS in Springfield, Missouri, I was teaching a course on Bible study methodology. And we were talking about this promise box method. So I opened my Bible and I said, you know, what, what does God want me to do today? And I opened it randomly and put my finger on the text. And it was the perfect text for this illustration because it was the text where God told Hosea, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land, land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Now, I don't really think that that was God's will for me that day. But there are people who try to determine God's will 
by doing that very thing. Another place where we have to be very careful in um, looking at the context would be the book of Job. Remember Job, he uh, was going through all kinds of trials and he had uh, the comforters that came and uh, tried to comfort him through what they said. <coughs> now the things that they said were totally wrong. Well, they said some good things here and there, but their argument was wrong. Now, if you go to their argument in the book of Job, and you take that as being uh, the truth, you are going to get in serious trouble. You've got to look at it in context. You've got to understand that it is uh, not saying that what they said is correct, even though what they said is in the Bible. So you need to look at the context. If you take the teachings of Job here, as I said, and, and his, his comforters, and you take that as truth, you're going to be in trouble. Um, although I heard of one pastor here in the States who not too long ago said the comforters were right. Well, I'm afraid not. Another place where you have to look at the context is in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, if you don't take the context, you're going to get in trouble there. So with literary context, we need to follow the flow of the author's argument. Fee calls, calls this tracing the argument. Why does Paul say this particular uh, thing at this particular place in the book, for example? And here we ask the question, what is the point? What is the author trying to say? We can know that only as we follow his argument and think his thoughts after him. So this is the immediate literary context. And Fee says, think paragraphs, not verses, not phrases, not single words, but paragraphs. Paragraphs are going to be your, your basic uh, building block for understanding scripture. Okay, not isolated verses. So trace the argument. Look at the argument that is coming on here, or the, the thought patterns, maybe we should say. When we think of argument, we think of somebody, you know, getting mad at somebody and that kind of thing. But look at, look at his, his way of thinking. He says this, then he says this, then he says this. Let's follow him through that logical pattern. And then... We ask, what is the point? What is he trying to say here in this passage? Or what is she trying to say, if, if that could be the, the case? And then think paragraphs. These are gonna be key concepts in understanding the literary context. If we go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, look at what Paul is saying in, in this entire section of the book. In starting at 110 and going through chapter six, there we see that he responds to several reports that he has gotten about what is going on in the Corinthian church. He is dealing in this uh, passage with divisions in the church and showing how that is, is uh, based on a false kind of wisdom. The next contest, context is going to be that of the entire letter of 1 Corinthians. We see that the basic theme of that book is the theme of unity 
in the church. Now, 1 Corinthians is very orderly in that Paul tends to deal with certain subject matter, and then he switches to another, and then another, very matter-of-factly. Uh, it's like he has his grocery list here that he's going through dealing with this subject, then this subject, then this subject. Um, and this is especially true, true in chapters 7 to 14. And there's a little key phrase that appears, normally it's called or translated now concerning or now about. And that is an indication that Paul is now turning to a different subject. He says, now about the things that you wrote about, now about, now about, now about. Uh, in his other letters, he, he normally doesn't do this. Uh, in Romans and Galatians, for example, uh, he has an argument there that is a flowing kind of argument going from one uh, thought to another through, to another and not just considering a series of items. Uh, one thing, one tool that might be helpful here is a book entitled Synopsis of the Pauline Letters in Greek and English by James P. Ware. And here is his treatment of the judgment seat of Christ. Now, remember 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17? If you destroy God's temple, God will destroy you. And in that context, he tells about the last judgment. He compares it to a fire, that uh, a big bonfire that our works will go into. And that which is not uh, made of gold, silver, and precious stones will be burnt up. That which is made of gold, silver, and precious stones will withstand the fire. And for that, we will get a reward. So we can, we can build on the foundation that he talks about there in chapter 3 in three different ways. We can build well, and for that we will get a reward. We can build poorly, and there will be no reward. Or we can destroy the temple, and for that we will be destroyed. And uh, what kind of destruction is that? I think that Paul is talking about... Um, eternal loss about a person going to hell. So um, we need to take this very seriously. Now in this book by where he goes to different passages in Paul where it talks about uh, being judged on the day of judgment. Now you'll notice that it's only in a footnote that he mentions our passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter three. The next larger, uh, uh, next larger context then is the entire New Testament. And then the next larger context is the whole Bible. Now, remember that Paul expects the people in the Corinthian church uh, not to read this letter, but to hear it. They automatically heard this passage in context. They didn't have the luxury of sitting down and, and reading the book of 1 Corinthians. They, didn't, they couldn't take it apart piece by piece, verse by verse, although there were no chapter divisions or verse divisions at that time. Uh, one person would stand in front of the congregation and he would read it to them. He would start at the beginning and go right on to the end. Uh, at one time. And probably a lot of the people in the church could not read anyway. We also need to realize that the chapter and verse, verse divisions that we have in our Bibles were not original. Paul didn't divide his letters into chapters and verses. Um, even the words 
in the New Testament, in the Greek New Testament, were not divided. They were all written together as if they were one word. Um, let me ask James. James, in Thai, don't you have that kind of thing where different words are all together? Correct me if I'm wrong, but... Uh, yes, yet we don't have like the space between words. Uh, they're written with spaces between. No, 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 no space. No. Only no space. between sentences. Okay. Only between sentences. Um, we were in Bangkok once, and there was this, this word on the side of a van beside us. And I was going to take a picture of it because it was so long, but I couldn't get the whole word in the picture. It went out one end and out the other. And... Um, that's the way the New Testament is with, with the, the spacing. There was no spacing between the words. And uh, there was very little in the way of punctuation. No commas, periods, question mark, exclamation marks. Um, now, there were several different ways of dividing it into chapters that were done over the centuries. The one that we use today was developed at the beginning of the 13th century, by Stephen Langdon. Uh, the first Greek New Testament to have verse divisions was one published in 1551, and it was developed by a man by the name of Robert Stephanus. And um, his son reported that he made the verse divisions on a trip between Paris and Lyon. And people have told stories about Robert Stephanus sitting on his horse, you know, uh, being bucked up and down on his horse, trying to do these verse divisions. Uh, probably that's not what his son meant. He probably meant that in the inns at night on the way that he did the verse divisions there, not on the, uh, the back of his horse. Uh, if you disagree with the verse divisions that we have, you could probably say, well, what do you expect? He was doing it on a horse, but he probably really wasn't. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make here is that the context is extremely important in understanding the meaning of a passage. Fee and Stewart say literary context is the crucial task in exegesis. Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard say an interpretation is more likely to be the correct one when it explains the passage in a way that is consistent with the theme of the section in which the passage occurs. Then the likely interpretation shows how that section contributes to the overall progress of the book itself. So, the, the first basic principle of hermeneutics is literary context, okay? Literary context, understanding how this passage fits in with the, the overall theme, what goes before it, what goes after it. Why does the author say this here and not at some other place in the book? Okay, do you have questions or comments here? Questions or comments? Have I said enough to confuse you? All right, let's go on. Study the historical cultural context. We need to make every effort that we can to understand the historical cultural context of the biblical writers because we are separated from them by thousands of years in time, thousands of kilometers in distance, and a huge distance in cultural understanding. We cannot read the biblical documents 
as if they were written in first century Asia or America or Europe or the islands or anywhere else in our world for that matter. Um, let, let, me, uh, let me give some examples here. When the New Testament says that Jesus is Lord, uh, we today take that as a purely religious statement. Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, is the one that we pray to, praise, and serve. But what did such terms mean in a first century Greek or Roman or Jewish context? Paul calls uh, Jesus Savior and Lord. The message of Jesus is called good news, the evangel. But we need to realize that each of those terms had deeply political meanings in the first century. Caesar was called Lord. He was called Savior. And when Christians proclaimed, Jesus is Lord, Kurios Jesus, they were giving a challenge to what the Romans said. Caesar is Lord, Kurios Caesar. And if Jesus is Lord, then Caesar is not. So you see, there are political ramifications to saying Jesus is Lord. For the Jew, the word kurios was the word that the Septuagint used for the name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh. Especially for Jews, it had huge ramifications when you call Jesus kurios. Jesus, Lord. Um, so when they read their scriptures, the name of God is Kurios. Now, the New Testament calls Jesus Kurios. What does that say about Jesus? We see, uh, for example, Paul quoting Old Testament texts that refer to the Lord and applying it to Jesus. When Mark begins his gospel, quoting Isaiah, uh, make uh, a straight path, a straight way for the Lord, who is the Lord there? It is Yahweh. It is God but he's applying it to Jesus. So if we are going to be able to translate the meanings of the first century AD or the fifth century BC uh, into an equivalent meaning for the 21st century, we need to know what it meant to them. And until we do, we are not gonna be able to uh, adequately apply this to our context today. Let me give another example. When John in Revelation writes to the church in Sardis, he tells, uh, he tells them to wake up. And he may have been drawing on their history. The history of the city of, Har of Sardis gives us an excellent example of what happened in the church in Sardis. The original city of Sardis was built upon what was believed to be impregnable cliffs, cliffs that, that nobody could climb up. Later it grew and was located in the valley at the foot of the cliffs. But if you look at those cliffs, that mountain way in the background there, that is where Sardis originally was built. Now, I took this picture from 
where Sardis moved to later on. And you will see ruins of the city of Sardis down there. But originally it was up there on those cliffs. In 549 BC, Cyprus, uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, came against Croesus, king of Lydia, whose capital was Sardis. Cyrus knew he couldn't advance to the west until Sardis, which was then at the top of the cliffs, was taken. So he offered a reward to anyone who could find a way to scale up the wall and enter the city. One soldier by the name of Heriodius was studying the situation when he saw a soldier of Sardis drop his helmet off the wall. The soldier then proceeded to go down the sheer face of the mountain and get it. Hieroides carefully noted exactly how the soldier was able to get down to his helmet and then get back up. Then he took a band of soldiers by night and they went in the same way the soldier had gone and found the wall at the top completely unguarded. They entered the city and overthrew it. The city fell because it wasn't watchful. And history repeated itself. 313 years later, Antiochus came against Sardis and captured it in the same way when his soldiers came over the same unguarded wall. How perfectly this described the church, uh, or the situation of the church at Sardis. It wasn't on guard. It was being lulled to sleep. When we try to determine the meaning of the passage, we must take into account the mindset of the people of that culture. The first century had an orientation toward honor and shame. And that is much closer to the way uh, Asians look at things than the way Americans look at things. Uh, those of you from Asia can probably understand this a lot better than we Americans. Um, America is very individualistic, and a lot of Americans don't really care what people think about them. Now, there's a lot of pill, uh, peer pressure when you are a teenager, and your friends, you know, you don't want to do anything that would make your friends um, I think you're strange or you wouldn't fit in with the crowd. Uh, but for the most part, Americans tend to be individualists. In Asia, it's much more communal. And honor, respect, and shame are much more important. Well, it was that way in the New Testament as well. And understanding that is a good uh, help in understanding the New Testament situation. Another example is that of the covenant that we see in the Old Testament, the covenant that God made with the children of Israel. It was not an entirely new form of document. When you compare the Sinai covenant with the treaties of the ancient Near East, you will see that there are many similarities. The covenant at Sinai was not between two equal parties. God didn't negotiate with the Israelites and come up with a mutually agreed upon contract with stipulations that were binding on both God and upon uh, the Israelites. When you compare the Sinai Covenant with the treaties of the ancient Near East, uh, there are so many comparisons that, uh, that uh, are seen. God gave the children of Israel a covenant, and all they could do was accept it or reject it. 
keep it or break it. And since God made it, only he could change or nullify it. The closest thing we have in our day to this is a last will and testament, where a person writes down what uh, he wants or how he wants his assets to be divided after he dies. Only he can change it. Uh, nobody else can. And um, that's the way it was with the covenants in the Old Testament. In Old Testament times, there were two kinds of covenants between nations. Sometimes nations entered into uh, agreements where both parties were equal. And we call these uh, parity treaties. The uh, two nations will uh, make an agreement. They're both equals. Um, but there was a, a kind of treaty that closely paralleled the covenant of Yahweh with Israel. It was a treaty made between a conquering nation and a subjected nation. And it was called a suzerain vassal treaty. The suzerain is the conqueror. The vassal is the uh, conquered country. So we have a superior and an inferior party here. So the conquering nation would give the stipulations to those uh, to that nation that they had conquered. They didn't say, hey, what, what do you think we ought to do about this? Should we uh, do it this way or that way? No, the conquered nation had no uh, part in coming up with the treaty. If you look at the format of those treaties, they parallel almost exactly the Mosaic Covenant, the Covenant of Moses. The conquering nation presented the treaty to the vassal nation, the conquered nation. They didn't negotiate. The conquered nation just accepted it and kept its provisions. And this is what a suzerain vassal treaty looked like. It looks something like this. It had a preamble and then a historical prologue. There were treaty stipulations. There were general clauses and specific stipulations. There were divine witnesses or guarantors. There were maledictions or curses. Uh, if you broke the treaty, this is what would happen. And if you kept the treaty, there were blessings. And um, I'll give you some examples here from uh, the Old Testament. You can look at this. We will not go into detail here in class. Our time is up. We will stop here. And we will see you on Friday. God bless you. And uh, let me just ask, does anybody have a quick question before you go? Uh, Samson. No? Okay. Anybody have a, a, a quick question? Uh, Brian. Yeah, your, your thoughts on the Amplified Bible, either the classical Amplified or the, uh, the newer Amplified, your thoughts, feelings on using those? Uh, the Amplified gives you various possible translations of words. Possible. Uh, however, it can't mean all of those things in one passage. Okay. So you're better off using a translation that uh, gives the best possible translation of that passage, of that word in that passage. Okay? Okay. Thank you. All right. God bless you. Uh, have a wonderful day, and we will see you on Friday morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you. God bless you.